Today, I want to take you back. Back to a time before From Software was known for Dark Souls, Bloodborne, and Demon Souls. Because those properties didn't exist yet. Back to a time before Hidetaka Miyazaki even worked for From Software. Back, in fact, to an era of friends. An era when lions would become kings. And an era where Ace of Base would rule the airwaves with their smash hit the sign. I'm talking 1994. And while O.G. Simpson was busy murdering his wife, if, if he did it, I mean, I had more important things to think about. The Sony PlayStation. The PlayStation released in December 1994 in Japan, and within weeks, so too did From Software's very first title, King's Field, the very first RPG for the Sony PlayStation, and it was never released to the US, and the PlayStation didn't come to the States until 1995. 1995, an era when Gangsta's Paradise was- Yeah, I'm not doing that again. And it was in 1995 that Kingsfield 2 was released to Japan. This sequel would come to the States in 1996 as Kingsfield Without the Two. Kingsfield Without the Two was the first RPG released to the US PlayStation. And on one fateful day, I don't remember when exactly, but it happened. My friend invited me over to his house to play a new game he'd gotten, Kingsfield. So, let's chat about kings and their fields. Off the shore of the Kingdom of Verdite is an island called Melanit. Lately, everyone who's gone there has ceased to return, and an evil darkness permeates from the island. Legends say, never approach the island for a sleeping beast in the darkness waits for a great awakening. See that? That dot in the distance? That's Melanit. You play as Alexander, a dumbass Prince. who decides to enter this island. And I know what you're thinking. Hot diggity damn are these graphics hot! And I got you! These graphics were cutting edge for the time, especially considering this was the very first 3D first-person RPG on the PlayStation. You start the game with no idea of where you are, but surrounded by water, and in stepping off- <laughs> Yeah... I'm not sure if water works that way. You must be wearing some pretty damn heavy armor to just fall through the water like that, and good thing I'm protected with- Oh. I'm naked. Nothing to do but explore. So avoid the deep water and... Aliens. Let's just run past the big one and... So, might be worth mentioning that King's Field is a notoriously hard game series. You thought the challenging game started with souls? <laughs> From software games have always had a level of challenge to them. It turns out you can run by holding the X button, which is a good way to slip past the giant alien and on the baby aliens. Fighting these, you'll discover the complex fight mechanics of King's Field. You have a strength gauge and need to wait for it to recover after swinging at an enemy, otherwise your power is poo poo. Other than that, it's a matter of waiting for an enemy to attack, then walking up and attacking them. Rinse and repeat. Either that or constantly strafing around your enemy as they slowly turn to try and be able to hit you again. And speaking of controls, I should probably mention that these don't work. Kingsville was made back before dual analog sticks were a thing. In fact, the first ever controller with dual analog sticks, the Sony PlayStation's DualShock controller, didn't release until 1997, a full year after the US release of King's Field. And even then, since it didn't come with systems, a lot of games didn't use it. So how does one control themselves in King's Field? Why, with these babies. Strafing is mapped to the shoulder buttons, as is looking down and up. A lot of modern gamers have trouble with this control scheme, as analog sticks have made it obsolete. But back in my day, you played with what you got! You're so old! In my day, you didn't have tutorials, you just died! You find important items absolutely vital to the game, and you can sell them and completely screw yourself over! Matter of fact, sometimes people couldn't even render fucking faces, so heads were just shapes! Oh wait. I'm, I'm just describing King's Field. Our first faceless man is a fisherman. So handsome. He explains that you've survived the shipwreck. Also, apparently people come to this island looking for treasure, but the island is poisoned and you need the water of the island to survive, so no one can leave! More importantly, those alien-looking things are actually krakens. And their heads melt, so there's that. 
With a little plot out of the way, it's time to explore the island you're stuck on. Scattered throughout the west coast, you'll find various weapons and armor that'll help you progress, meaning the game constantly rewards you for your exploration. And the game is surprisingly well balanced with this. While the game is an RPG, and you'll be leveling up various stats, you're constantly finding new and more powerful equipment as you explore, and you'll never really feel the need to grind. You'll also find your first notable spot, a cave within the island that is home to a restorative fountain, some slime, and the very first secret passage. These secret passages are vital to your success in the game, as they frequently house especially strong items, or traps to murder you. It's a From Software game. I'm not sure what you were expecting. And how does one find a secret passage? Simple, you buffoon! All you have to do is rub up against the wall, constantly tap X, and pray to God something's there. Which is why the majority of my recorded footage looks like this. I knew my PhD in wall checking would come in handy. Someday! While you do have your face stuck up against the wall half of the time, this was actually a major reason I enjoyed King's Field so much. There's secrets everywhere, like, see this waterfall? Obviously there's a secret cave behind it, filled with skeletons, treasure, and- Death. Lots of death. Continuing forward, you'll find a true staple of the Kingsfield series, what I lovingly refer to as watermelon heads, as they look like a cracked open watermelon. Look, they're probably actually Venus flytraps or some shit like that, but fuck that! Watermelon heads for life! You'll also discover magic spewing snails, and oh hey, it's the waterfall again. As it turns out, Kingsfield is actually surprisingly interconnected, so even as you get further along in the game, you'll find a multitude of routes that connect back to the previous areas. With the west coast fully explored, for now, it's time to head into the next area, which is always marked by a music shift. This particular area features the song Passage for a Monk, one of the many spooky, atmospheric songs that helps bring a level of dread to the demon-filled labyrinths you'll be exploring. This area also includes a couple tiny villages, some not so inhabited, but others thriving with like, four people total. You've got Raffi Foss, who sells goods, Mark Waz, the keysmith, Nola Bagel, or Bagel, whatever, and Al Hunt, who can't stop eating. That's literally his main trait. I cannot go down below because I'm too fat. Al, Al no, stop, stop eating. Al, you have a problem. Al, Al no, Al, Al. We learn from Nola that only special parts of this island have sunlight and the rest are always dark. Also, her brother, Dias, came to the island of Melanid a couple years ago and has disappeared. More importantly though, Nola, you had the smallest butt I have ever seen. I mean, your head is the same width as the entirety of your butt. Look, I'm not especially thick, but even my butt is wider than my head! There's also a surprising amount of vertical level design for such an early game. Some pathing requires you to find areas you can drop down onto, making them feel hidden and thereby rewarding. There's also several times you'll need to jump blindly into a pit to explore what's there, which really ups the anxiety as you have no idea how to return to where you were before. So let's jump into our first random pit for adventure. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, sure, I might almost be dead, but there's a fucking secret. Locked. Oh, and now I'm stuck. No secret passages, so... Yep, stuck. Well, this is awkward. And then Dave attempted to use his wall-checking PhD, failing forever, stuck at the bottom of a pit. For all of eternity. Forever, and ever, and ever. Until he starved to death and died. <laughs> At this point, you have a couple options of where you can go. We could head to the small mine slash small graveyard, where you'll run into Fi, a friend of Nola's brother Dias. He explains that the island is overrun by mindless soldiers controlled by a man named Necron. If you check out the small mine, you'll run into a single miner who explains everyone has left the small mine for the big mine, as the small mine ran out of crystals everyone has been mining for. Like the crystal in his bucket! I'll just go ahead and take that. What? He didn't notice? And it's not a crime unless they find out and get mad at you, right? 
Logan Paul, right? T Martin, right? Pro Syndicate, right? Arya Masal, right? Daddy O5, right? Zillion Ope, right? So the big mine becomes our destination point. In order to get there, we have to traverse through a number of the bases where you'll first run into Necron's guards. While you could fight them the normal way, I find it far more satisfying to drop them off of a bridge. I mean, sure, you don't get any experience, but sometimes it's about the experience. God, that sounded cheesy. This also introduces us to what I refer to as Rhombus Key Hell. These keys can be placed at a door to open them only from the side you place them on. You can take them out and interchange them as you please, and so long as you explore, you'll find enough of them to not have to worry about them too much, but they're still a huge pain in the ass. The area contains a prison with Ernest, a guy who's a Verdite soldier, and will give you a dragon stone, which is actually pretty damn important. These stones can be placed into a dragon fountain, where you can find special healing liquids that you can store in crystal flasks. Beyond the prison, you'll notice a music change indicating you're in a new area, the Central Village. The way forward is blocked by a concerned parent whose son, Sandler, has gone missing in the Termite's Nest. So, to get her to move, we'll just find the Termite's Nest, which should be somewhere around here. Maybe that sign will tell us. Oh god. Oh god! Oh god! You know what? I'm just saying, I don't think Sandler's worth it. I'm gonna need you to move. You know, just, just a little. Okay, maybe just a little more. Just for good measure. <laughs> Blocking the way. <sighs> Fucking NPCs. She was hiding a whole village from me! With spooky fortune tellers who are sometimes there and sometimes aren't, Kelfi, a dark elf who works for Necron, and a crystal flask maker. Hell, there's even a healing fountain and more secret passages! I can't imagine why the game was trying to block me off from going here. Oh. Okay, whatever. Let's go into the termite's nest and save Sandler. By running, you can cross traps in the ground. So, over the termite's trap, we find... Termite's nest ahead. Watch your step. This area always freaked me out as a kid, because A, the termites make this noise as they attack you, which is scary enough, but B, their edge detection doesn't always work, and sometimes they fall off of the upper ledge and have fallen on my head while playing. So, all I'm saying is, FUCK THE TERMITE'S NEST! At the end of the nest, you'll find the queen termite who pumps out little baby termites until defeating her. She's actually pretty easy if you know that she's weak to a bow. And behind her is Sandler, just... just... hanging out. All nonchalant. How did you survive? For saving Sandler, he'll gift you the pirate key, which allows you access to the pirate's treasure. Uh, another... ANOTHER KEY! Hey, The skull key. That's... FUCKING AWESOME! Remember that secret behind the waterfall? Well, the skull key can be used for another dragon stone. And by placing the final dragon stone, we can unlock the gold fountain. Gold water can be stored in your crystal flasks and heals your health, all status ailments, and your MP, which I failed to mention. So, let's talk magic. By finding and using various elemental crystals, you'll unlock magic spells. These aren't too important at the beginning of the game, as you have limited MP, and finding ways to restore MP are either expensive or rare, but as you progress, magic becomes incredibly important. Magic acts similar to attacking, just taking up MP, and can be used in conjunction with attacking to stunlock enemies. In other words... I'm a cheap bastard and typically just use the lowest MP consumption magic like Fireball, along with swinging my sword to stunlock enemies into submission. So, you're welcome. Kingsfield just became ten times easier. Magic recovery in hand, let's head out past the central village into Harvine's castle. King Harvine, who ruled the northern continent, and had a creepy as fuck castle surrounded by lava and filled with skeletons and ghosts. There's not much to do here yet, as the castle is locked off, but beyond it we can finally open the path to a new area with super creepy music, the Eastern Co- FUCK! Which contains giant jumping spiders. My favorite! 
The East Coast is home to a spooky ghost. For real, you'll meet Leon Shore's mother, who after talking to her, checking out her random painting, and receiving the kinda important figure of Seath, will just disappear. But her rocking chair keeps on rocking. With most things taken care of at this point, let's head to the big mine. Apparently Necron has been trying to find some item in the big mine, so we'll have to beat him to the punch. And before I go on, I want to talk about how non-linear the game is, and how much it adds to the game. Remember, this is a game that's centered on exploration, and while I've been doing things in a particular order, because I happen to know the quick and smart way to progress, on a first playthrough you can go to just about anywhere you want with no real blocks outside of your level and equipment. Even Sandler's mom, you can get past if you want, and hell, you can make a beeline to the final boss. It's just not a good idea because you're so low leveled, but you can. And that's part of what's so great about the game. It doesn't hold your hand and it lets you explore as you please. The Big Mine feels like a major event in the game, as a lot of the dialogue is built up to it. It's also one of the longer stretches in the game without any way to save your progress. You'll enter via a minecart where there's several levels to the mine and key items. One of these is Harvine's Key, which unlocks Harvine's Castle. Further down, past the Cave of Darkness, Cave of Poison, and Earth Elemental Cave, which I'll- I'll get to you later, dinosaurs! is the Elf Cave, containing the important Elf's Key. With the big mine finished, equipped with better equipment, and at a higher level, it's time to re-explore some previous areas. Harvine's castle, which contains an angry painting. You are an intruder in my castle, therefore, you must die! That sets off a trap, and contains a shrine key, and behind the giant kraken, which contains a second shrine key. Shrine keys in hand, we can head deeper into Necron's lair, where we'll find Leon Shore, who's a master crafter and wants a dark crystal made by the dragon god Seath so he can craft a sword to defeat the dragon god Gyra. So, let's talk some lore. In the past, the dragon gods Gyra and Seath duped it out. From fighting for so long, they have no more energy. Therefore, Gyra made the Moonlight Sword to kill Seath, and Seath made the Dark Slayer to kill Gyra. Also, supposedly Necron resurrected Gyra, which is bad, and Seath is good. Even though Gyra helps the protagonist in the first Kingsfield game to defeat the evil with his Moonlight Sword, Anyways, just past Leon Shore, we'll find Kelfi again, who has moved shop. Kelfi now sells the Runus boots. Damn, I want those Runus boots, but holy hell are they expensive! In fact, they're more expensive than the game's ultra-expensive gold key! But you can see them, just past Kelfi, just sitting there. So, remember that sweet trick I showed you earlier? And that is how you get some sweet ass boots. And a crystal flask. And if you talk to Kelphie afterwards, the boots aren't for sale anymore. It's seriously the best. The game actually took into account this trick. Beyond the obligatory fire and ice areas, we finally reach the elf shrine, a location where we need to utilize those shrine keys I talked about. It's also a trap unless you know how to solve the puzzle, which by the way, the game is filled to the brim with traps. Trap walls, floor traps, skeletons and treasure chests, skeletons dropping from the ceiling, swinging sharp things, and more. Imagine Sen's funhouse from Dark Souls, but scattered throughout the entire game. Which, I can't stress enough, makes exploring that much more rewarding. Surviving the dangerous traps after finding what seems like a secret area, then being rewarded with genuinely useful items is the norm of this game. You always feel like there's danger on the brim, but again, the game properly rewards you for conquering the danger. It's so good! As for the shrine, if you recall Leon's ghost mom, the painting in her room reveals the secret combination. And with that, we can find the ancient dragon grass, who reveals all the lore I already told you, see sword, and by exchanging the elf's key from the big mine, the dark crystal Leon had been wanting. With it, he starts crafting the dark slayer, which Necron then steals from him. Fucking Necron, man! That's it! I've had enough of Necron shit! You can send mindless soldiers and demons after me, but- Wait. Oh no, seriously, those are legit devils. In fact, it turns out Necron has been literally incubating devils, and to do this, he was using an electric volt magic crystal and what's actually an easter egg from the original Kingsfield Japanese game. This is actually something I never knew until I made a let's play of the original game for my channel, as the game was never officially released outside of Japan. But in the incubator pods are a couple of fairies who look exactly like Miria, the dragon's fairy from Kingsfield 1, Japan, who was the dragon's fairy and served the dragon line since ancient times. 
Outside of the Devil's Incubators, the area consists of a boss rush before finally encountering Necron. Necron, who turns out to be Dias Bagel. In other words, Small Butt's missing brother who turns super evil. No! The boss fight is actually really good, with Necron having strong melee attacks as well as powerful magic he'll constantly shoot at you. When you do defeat him, you'll get the Dark Slayer and be able to progress on to Gyra. So, Gyra is in outer space, and you can beat him to save the day, and yada yada, whatever. None of that's important. What is important is that behind Gyra is the Moonlight Sword, and while you're supposed to get the Moonlight Sword after beating Gyra, which immediately ends the game, this is King's Field! The game is seriously filled with secrets. While it's tricky to pull off without dying, you can sneak past Gyra by running past him or having him toss you over him, allowing you to pick up the Moonlight Sword without finishing the game. Then, if you kill yourself with the Dragon Crystal on hand, you'll be revived at the Golden Fountain with Moonlight Sword in hand and be able to use it! It's a fully functioning sword and even has weapon magic, which is another secret of the game. If your stats are high enough and you do a certain button combo, certain swords will shoot out various magic spells at enemies that are unique to the sword. And speaking of secrets, once you get various gates, such as the Stargate, Stargate, that was in front of us the whole time. And their corresponding key, you can place these on pedestals near a save point. Then, by using 10 MP, you can warp back at any time. It's not only convenient for fast traveling, but allows you to get the secrets at the bottom of giant pits that would otherwise be dead ends. One of my favorite swords in the game takes us back to the dinosaur-esque Earth Elementals. The sword is an incredibly rare drop from them, to the point where, when I first played the game as a kid and read about it on GameFAQs, I legitimately thought the posters were lying. When I made a Let's Play of this game, it took killing 389 of these fuckers to get the sword. Then, when I initially recorded this footage for my Super Show, I somehow managed to get it on my first try, and thought I was the luckiest person on Earth, only to realize I'd accidentally recorded my computer mic along with the footage. Really helped her, maybe. I should curse you with the Holy Ghost. It's possible. You did get cursed, though. Just, you gotta tell us the next couple of days. Yeah. Maybe. You know what? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, in order to get clean audio, I completely re-recorded the entire game. And this time, it took me over three hours! So, maybe not the luckiest person on Earth. Anyways, the sword is amazing if you get it at this point in the game, as it constantly recovers your MP while it's equipped. And if you remember that asshole painting in Harvine's castle, which sets off a trap, afterwards the painting claims to be sealed. But if you attack the painting, it will disappear and you can access a secret spell behind it. The game is filled with this type of content, and it makes it an absolute joy to play through. Kingsfield was the game that kickstarted from software, and inspired several of their future franchises. The Moonlight Sword has appeared in several other From Software games. Seath, the albino dragon of Dark Souls, was named after the dragon god from the Kingsfield series we meet in Kingsfield 2, and his tail drop is the Moonlight Sword. And Demon Souls, the game that would lead to Dark Souls, was meant as a spiritual successor to Kingsfield. Kingsfield is an incredibly fond childhood memory, and I'd excitedly go over to my friend's house just to play it. It's a game I still replay to this day, and it always fills me with nostalgia. Fists. What? And then Dave stood up unzipped his pants on camera, and fisted himself so hard he died. A huge, huge thank you to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Thank you so much, One-Eyed Sniper, Richard Sun, Dark Sun Rebel, Ashlish, Invidentia, Ryan Drawn, Marcus Rostin, Jason Buck, and everyone else who supports me. Honestly, it means the world to me. And thank you so much as well to my co-host from Nerdwire, Whitney Van Lanningham. She is amazing. Go check her out. Just, just do it. Just, just do it. And I'll see you guys later. Peace.